Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in a sermon series. You don't know what that is. That's where after so many weeks in a row, all of the sermons kind of tie in together. And our sermon series right now is from one part of Scripture where we hear of the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, but this fall, if you come, uh, starting about the end of July, starting about the end of July, we're going to mix some of this up. We're going to go all out for the kids, just as we have now, but remember, we're kids too, no matter what our age is. And so we're going to start um, pairing up our sermons in the worship time, and what the what the pastors preach on in the scripture topics with what the kids are learning as well. So that they will come home with hearing the same Bible stories and the same main points and messages. And you'll even have an opportunity for adults, if you want to stick around for Sunday school afterwards for adults, you can dig deeper into that day's lesson as well. And so it's exciting to be doing these things for our young people. I was reading again... Um, the studies that are out there, and you've maybe heard this before, but I looked it up for sure to see what it said, and it said, nearly half of all Americans who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior do so before reaching the age of 13. 13. Which is why Vacation Bible School is so important, and why our kids are so important, and we're going to be doing more things to just continue to pour into our kids and their parents and our communities and do whatever we can to support families and families of all ages as well. It says that two out of three born-again Christians make a commitment for Jesus before their 18th birthday. We got to get them. And then after that, um, one out of eight between the ages of 18 to 21 and then it goes down after that. So we have them now. At our church, and like other churches, we have a tradition of confirmation. And maybe you grew up with something called confirmation. And it's a time, usually in the middle school, junior high ages, where we gather together the middle schoolers, junior high, 6th, 7th, 8th graders, and in its intense study uh, for a couple years with the pastors after school. And we go through the Bible, and where did it come from, and we talk about Jesus Christ and what he means for our lives, and and we go through the calling that God has placed in our lives. What is our purpose in this world? And it feels like it's a lot of heady stuff. And um, I remember in, in seminary, grad school to be a pastor, asking my professor, why do we have confirmation, this big heady time of learning, at the age of middle school? Because wouldn't it make more sense when they're in high school or college, young adults, adults, you know, when we have it all figured out, right? And the professor said, no, it's middle school. This time when they're between being a kid and they're starting to become an adult and now all of a sudden their lives are going topsy-turvy, crazy. It's not the way they thought it was going to be. They're starting to have the opposite of peace in their lives and they need somebody every week telling them that God loves them and he has a plan for them and bringing them peace. I have a picture of me in eighth grade, confirmation, and this is what I looked like. <laughs> See those big glasses? It was the 90s, but I still had those big brown glasses. I didn't get contacts till I was in high school the next year, but at this point I had a perm and zits. Well, I still have zits, and I'm still awkward. I don't know what happened there, but you remember going through all of that, and um, in the inside too, not just your outside, but your emotional all over the place. I remember crying with my mom and saying, I don't know why I'm so upset, but something, nothing is wrong, but I'm so mad. And it's just kind of how it goes. And you start to realize that there's a world outside of you as well. You start to see issues, um, my family, like many of your families, going through different, different situations, different turmoils, um, just issues. The, the month that this picture was taken actually was also when the Oklahoma City bombing happened. You remember that? And you start to see that there's a world out there. Our kids are growing up now after 9-11 and, and they know, they know that the world is not a peaceful place. 
And so, my confirmation Bible verse I chose was all about peace. It was this one, John 14, and I can say it right now. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. And I needed that as an eighth grader, inside, outside, seeing the world. I needed this peace that was going to last, that was nothing like the world was giving me. And so here we are in our sermon series talking about peace. And if I could give you like a secret solution today in one sermon, here's how you can have simple peace in your family life. Um, but, you know, last night as I'm working on this sermon, I have one kid chewing gum loudly in my ear. I have another one who's totally happy across the room, you know, needs nothing, but I can smell that diaper <laughs> clear across the room. And another who's just standing there crying for no apparent reason. So I don't have have a solution for peace in those ways, but I have hope, and I'd like to share with you that hope today, that hope of peace from the Lord. And a first glimpse of hope is to just name the trouble, say, yes, there is big trouble in the world. Our middle schoolers know this. This is how Taylor Swift can make a whole lot of money because she sings trouble, trouble, trouble. Our kids know that between relationships and, you know, breaking their hearts and all the issues in life. They know there's going to be trouble. Our little ones know because otherwise Disney wouldn't be making all these Disney movies with, you know, parents who are dying and trouble and Kung Fu Panda and, and that other... I never did figure out that other animal, but they're all looking for inner peace, inner peace, inner peace in Kung Fu Panda. And so it doesn't matter what our age is, we're looking for peace. And when I talk with our confirmation kids, our middle schoolers, about peace they know, and what, what a moment of grace when I can say to them, did your week go perfect for you? And they say, no. Do you anticipate next year in school getting in trouble, getting grounded? Every single kid raises their hand. Yes, they do. Why is it that somehow when we become an adult, we figure somehow we're going to get it all figured out? We can solve those solutions. Our, our kids know better. And they're honest. And it is a moment of hope when we can be honest with them and say, yes, there is trouble in this world. Jesus knew it. And he spoke to that trouble. And in John 16, Jesus says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. God knew that the world was broken. He knew you'd have broken relationships. He knew there would be war, that there would be illnesses, that there would be struggle. It was to this world that he sent his son, his perfect son, Jesus. And he foretold it with the prophets in the Old Testament, in the prophet Isaiah. We hear that God had a plan to send this child. For to us, a child is born, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The Lord knew what he was doing when he sent his son, Jesus, into a broken world. One of the most controversial scriptures that you can read <laughs> is when Jesus didn't even shy away from the language of trouble and war and the swords and the brokenness of families. And in Matthew chapter 10, and you can go home later and read the whole Bible. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, this is just an aside. We'd like you to take one with you today. There's Bibles on the, on the um, Bible rack back there. You can look through, find one that, that works for you. There's kids' Bibles that are outside right now. So if you'd like one for your family, please take one and read it. It's the most honest thing you're going to read <laughs> probably for your whole life. It's the most honest thing you're going to read. And Jesus says in Matthew 10, don't suppose I've come to bring peace to the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And we wonder, what did he mean by this? Jesus is bringing a sword. He's bringing truth to pierce our hearts. Peace only comes when we acknowledge that there is something that's broken, that is wrong. And so Jesus comes with a sword to tackle that trouble head on. He brings real pre peace, not like this world. And so in John 14, he says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. The peace I give is not anything that the world can give, so don't be troubled or afraid. What does this peace look like, this peace that comes from 
from Jesus. It's not a might makes right. They thought when the prophet said he's going to send his son to bring peace to the world, they thought he was going to come with an army. They thought he was going to bring up a kingdom on earth. But Jesus came for the heavenly kingdom. Jesus came to reign in your life, in your heart. Jesus came for the kingdom yet to come, that you would be there with him someday. And he is not going to give up on you. In any of your trouble, he will forgive you. He will be by your side, fighting by your side. So someday he will take you to be with him. 2 Corinthians, we heard this verse this week with our kids singing about the light of the world in Jesus Christ. We hear that now we have this light shining in our hearts. We ourselves, we are fragile like clay jars, but we contain a great treasure and it makes it clear that this great treasure is a great power from God, from God and not from ourselves. We are pressed on all sides by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are hunted down. We are never abandoned by God. We got knocked down, but we are not destroyed. That is so powerful in the ages of 6th, 7th, and 8th graders and high schoolers to tell them, yes, you are crushed. You will not be destroyed. Jesus has a plan for you. And so let's tackle that trouble head on, just like Jesus does. And that brings hope and peace. Number two, we can bring hope of peace by, uh, by working toward peace. It's in the Bible. <laughs> we are called to work toward peace. Now, we're not going to be able to achieve it, which is the hardest thing, because we can't do it ourselves. It has to be the Holy Spirit working peace in our hearts and in the world. It has to be Jesus bringing peace, but we are called to be a part of that. We are called to be peacemakers. And what a witness to our young people when they see us actually working toward peace and standing on the side of, of the Bible. Um, kids want peace. Adults want peace. Look at the comic books. We have Superman trying to force peace, right? You remember Superman, the fourth movie, The Quest for Peace? You don't? It's because it didn't work out. <laughs> he didn't actually achieve peace. He tried to, you know, get rid of all those nuclear weapons, quit all the war, make everybody get along. It didn't work out. S sorry for the spoiler if you wanted to watch that movie. Um, you can go back and watch it. But no Superman can force change of people's hearts. We can't do it. But yet, what hope when people got to watch that movie and hear these superheroes are actually trying for peace. That's what we are to do as Christians. Trust in our God and work toward peace. I didn't say this. This is from the Bible. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, God blesses those who work for peace. They will be called the children of God. Romans chapter 12, live in harmony with each other. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. As I get older and I read more and more of the Bible, I can't help but to become more and more anti-war. I'm so thankful for those who serve in our armed forces and in awe of what they do. And even our armed forces are called upon to bring peace into the world. I can't help but to read scripture and to see how all of us, no matter our job, even the tough ones in this world, we're called to work for peace. Hebrews chapter 12, work at living in peace with everyone. And all the political debates that will be on TV and all those um, commercials and no government laws, no government treaties will ever be able to change people's hearts. And you will not hear this in any of the political debate. Romans chapter 12, bless those who persecute you. Do you hear that? <laughs> In the government, do you hear, don't curse them, but pray that God will bless them? Do you hear any politician saying, live in harmony with each other? Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone? This is the difference that Jesus Christ brings. Real peace. We can't bring peace ourselves, but we can bring Jesus. That's what we are called to do. 
We're called to bring the hope of Jesus Christ and his peace. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Remember, God has identified you as his own. You, his son, you, his daughter, you are his. He is guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. For all those who call on his name, he is a place for you in heaven. So, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. What a witness to our kids when we work for peace. When we teach them, say you're sorry, forgive him, forgive one another, Try to make it better. How can you help if you made a mistake? How can you help? Did you know that God loves you even though you made a mistake? He's not going to give up on you. Let's say those things to our kids. And let's say them to ourselves. And let's say them to our communities. To our neighborhoods. Can we as adults say, I forgive you? I'm not going to give up on you? To our family members, to our neighbors, can we work for earthly peace, not because of anything we can do, but because of what Jesus does? Colossians chapter 3 says, make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. You will not hear this anywhere in our government. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. Always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives and teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. We work toward peace. It'll be a struggle, but God's not done with you. He's by your side. Finally, we have hope when we see the fruit that the Holy Spirit works in our lives. This is hard because remember at the beginning when I said I don't have a solution for you to have, you know, a perfect peaceful house where none of the kids are ever going to be crying and they're all going to be potty trained easily just like that. That's not going to happen. But... We have hope, and God is at work in this world, and you will see that fruit. So keep your eyes open, because our living God is producing fruit of peace right now today. So look for it. There are opportunities that the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ are putting peace in our hearts and in the world. Go where God is. Galatians chapter 5 says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Jesus said, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. The peace I give, the world can't give you. So don't be troubled or afraid. I still have trouble, um, even as an adult, but I have hope. And I have love and I have forgiveness of Jesus. I have a promise that Jesus will take me to heaven. This gives me peace and you can have this peace too. And if you haven't heard the good news, let me tell it to you again today. Jesus Christ took the opposite of peace on his shoulders. Jesus Christ was illegally condemned of a crime. Jesus Christ had all of his friends on earth abandon him. Jesus had his family watch as he was tortured. Jesus suffered and was publicly humiliated. Jesus died in excruciating death. And the Son of God, having loved completely, His enemies, having loved completely the sinful world, having loved you completely, Jesus Christ took up his cross and he died for you. And three days later, Jesus rose from the dead and he's alive. And people saw him. 
And Jesus is living with the Father in heaven, and he says that someday he will come back, he will take you and all those who call on his name to be with him in heaven forever. This is your peace, this is your promise that you can have today as well, even as you face all of the troubles of this world. Now we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we have a light shining in our hearts. Even though we ourselves are like fragile, fragile clay jars, inside is a great treasure, the power of God. And we are pressed on all sides, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We might be hunted down in this earth, but you will never be abandoned by God. You might get knocked down, but you will never be destroyed. That is our peace and our hope in the name of Jesus Christ.